The following program is classified G. It's suitable for all ages. Tonight, we discuss the fundamentals that govern companies in Sri Lanka. During these difficult times for Sri Lankans, it is quite pivotal that we understand the existing legislature and its vacuums when considering setting up business ventures. Are we still in a state of infancy when considering the stages of setting up and running large-scale enterprises? Where are the loopholes? How can we better understand the functioning of companies in the eyes of the Sri Lankan law? Good evening and welcome to Law, Land and Liberty. We are, we are keeping with the promise of bringing in a contemporary legal topic and breaking it down for our viewers. Now, given the situation within the country, we have decided to give a bit more prominence to the entrepreneurship side, the enterprise side of uh, how the country functions and to give the legal uh, background to how it has been within this country for quite some time. And based on that thought process, we thought of bringing down corporate law, the company law within a country and giving, in, giving our viewers an understanding of uh, how it really functions. And to give the breakdown, we have with us someone who has been uh, a stalwart, someone who has been a very prominent figure in corporate law within our country, someone the legal profession really doesn't need an introduction to this individual. President's Counsel, Dr. Harsha Kabral, thank you so much, sir, for joining us today. Thank you for the invitation. Um, with the, the doctor, the doctor who is one of the main architects of the Companies Act uh, number no. 7 of 2007, we are going to give a primary breakdown of what that act is, where we are right now, and where the evolution process should take place. Uh, he has been practicing for over 35 years, he has been a President Counsel for 16 years. He's an academic and a leading author in this very subject, in this very field. And uh, a lot of things to talk with Doctor uh, on, on, on this very specific subject. And in general, how we conduct this uh, program is we give a breakdown of what the program is going to entail, so it's easier for our viewers to follow the entire content. Firstly, we're going to talk a bit about the basic corporate law within the country to give the preliminary outline and to start off our discussion there. Next, a bit about corporate governance, which is going to take you through the stakeholders, the, the, the main stakeholders of corporate law. And finally, a bit about the new SEC Act. Hi, I'm Hasur Kodituaku. I am a design engineer at Milwaukee Tool USA. My question is on the corporate law. What are the features of the basic corporate law within Sri Lanka? All right, let's get into the discussion straight away. Thank you once again, Doctor, for joining us. Um, where do we begin uh, when we uh, initiate the discussion on the basic corporate law of Sri Lanka, Doctor? I think, uh, as usual, as we started, we are going to generally be pushed towards the Companies Act of number 7, 2007. I think uh, if you can give us an introduction there as to where we are right now, I think it will be important to our viewers. Yeah, in fact, the current law we have is the Companies Act number 7 of 2007. Now, if I may give a little precursor to this particular act, uh, we took quite a long time to come up with this act. And uh, you may know that we have a company law advisory commission. So this advisory commission had to study this because uh, in the 90s, we saw a lot of changes, especially internationally, also locally, where changes were needed. But unfortunately, the law we had, that is 17 of 90, Companies Act number 17 of 1982, was fairly outdated because that was based on the 1948 English Act. So from 1948 in England, there were so many changes, but even in the 2000s, there were changes. But unfortunately, those changes were not brought into our company law as such. So uh, actually there was about a nine year gestation period for the new Companies Act and there were breakdowns in between and the advisory commissions were changed and I think I was the only member who survived two regimes in the advisory commission. And after nine years, we managed to come up with this new law that is Companies Act number seven of 2007. Now. The, the terms of reference, I must say, which were given to us initially were based on a World Bank funded project where a gentleman came from New Zealand. Because New Zealand had got a brand new company, Companies Act, and he brought with him the, the, the new company law from New Zealand. 
and new zealand law was also in turn based on the canadian model of modern corporate law now based on that we were we prepared 10 position papers where changes were needed amendments were needed first we had to consider whether amending the 17 of 1988 82 act was uh, limited and then we decided that the best part is to, because sometimes too much tinkering to a old law can create problems this is all following up to the 2007 act is it 2007 act yeah. and then we came up with the uh, companies act number 27 of 2007 now that i must say though we structured it on the new zealand model the new zealand model is based on the canadian model right now why i say canadian model is a little away from the english law because traditionally we have had english law because company law is basically the birthplace of company law is england and uh, if you look at our historical st- laws or statutes or ordinances based on company law we go back to 1860 we had the joint stock companies act right. 1860 then in 1948 uh, we had the 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 then in 38 we had the companies ordinance and then the ordinance was there till 17 of 1982 the companies act but this the, they were all based on predominant english law but then what happened over the years you could see that the english law was changing rapidly and there were a couple of new developments that took place because when you look at the old english law there was this concept uh, the theory sort of even the courts thought that the companies are managed by gentlemen you know that concept was there so therefore the courts were reluctant to interfere in the management of companies the law delden long years ago in a case has said that you know courts should not be called upon to interfere or to manage the uh, brew house and the play house because those two were the most important businesses in england at that time so they thought always it was g- g- governed by good uh, gentlemen so we should not interfere that much same happened in sri lanka as well right. and we kept on you know following the same principle if you know i mean your grandparents would know we had old companies like you know uh, british car company walker and giri walkers browns collards all the old uh, plantation companies which were governed by the britishers and there are after also you know the white clad gentlemen who managed those companies but overall internationally uh, especially across the atlantic the thinking was slightly different okay. the americans thought that you know companies are not managed any more by gentlemen and uh, maybe crooks get into corporate world so that they wanted regulation so the first regulatory mechanism came with the uh, new york stock exchange so canada which was a country like sri lanka which followed the english law to the letter got down the best uh, brains on company law like uh, uh, lcb professor lcb gover and such people from england that is from england and to see whether this is true whether we must have regulation complete regulation or whether and they came up in la, in uh, first was in ontario business corporation act and uh, they are after the canadian business corporation act which was sort of a mix of the english law and american law where regulation was brought in they thought well if public money is invested you need a lot of regulation so the canadian model is considered today as one of the best formulas of uh, company law and that law has been followed in countries like australia new zealand japan new york uh, hong, uh, hong kong and uh, even in uh, even in england right. even in england they thought that their law was archaic because england uh, they have a lot of uh, uh, changes with the ec directives coming in after they became a european union country ec directives brought in so uh, so the traditional english law what i has told you that you know good people manage company you should not interfere that changed a little bit so the regulation came in so with that in mind we had to structure our law so we had 12 position papers one was how to simplify the you know from starting from incorporation to winding up we must have a simplified way of doing it and even if you can remember the form 48 those did the directors uh, forms uh, like you know it was like a bed spread you know it had four different and now it's only a a4 sheet of paper you can right. download it and you know you can incorporate companies and things like that lot more can be done mm-hmm. but but i must uh, must say that uh, the simplification process 
how to incorporate because there were two documents memorandum of association articles of association of memorandum was done away with the doctrine of antra virus there was the uh, principle there that was taken out and uh, so now we have only articles of association they are again objects clause even if you want you can have your objects clause it was not mandatory right just to get a clarification on on this outset doctor the articles of association is up to the discretion of the company itself it is not something dictated by the law about you know this is how it should be structured no or? they give you a guideline for example right. the company is act 7 of 2007 has 534 sections 46 forms and 13 schedules right now schedule 1 is the model articles okay so you have a guideline is given i mean if you want you can adapt the uh, schedule 1 or you can have your own article articles is your like constitution i mean in, in, in new zealand they call it the news uh, the constitution of the company right right uh, doctor if you can just give us a bit of a take on the schedule 1 if you can tell us the salient features of what should be included within an articles of association or is it again up to the discretion of those companies yeah it is up to the discretion of the company but you can't have certain things over and above the what is given in the company's act right you see for example Uh, the basic like if you have your say in your school you have your this brotherhood or christian uh, fellowship or uh, history society or whatever you will have a constitution right that constitution will say okay you will have a president you will have a vice president you will have a secretary you will have a treasurer you all will meet once a month the objectives are this so on and so forth so the company is uh, document is also that they yeah. will have a chairman you will have a managing director you will have x amount of executive directors non executive directors you will have how to have meetings notices share transactions all those are set out in your articles of association right doctor if you can um, before we go into details about you know the stake the stakeholders as in the directors and everyone i think we can cover that within our sec- second segment uh the incorporation aspect doctor um how the registration process takes place is there is it more streamlined after is, are we still are we following something that has been adopted maybe even in canada so that will be that is again a bit of yeah incorporation has been made easier with the mechanism but unfortunately you know the registrar of companies also another government organization and uh, we have the problems you know like in other government institutions yeah. so overall you need a lot of changes to be brought in to these government institutions but uh, documentation part has been made easier right right so even if you want i mean in other countries you have do it yourself packs you can go and buy it from the uh, off the shelf uh, in a supermarket and then you can incorporate your own company so if you want you can do that uh, in sri lanka too but we'll, we always go to a reputed company secretary or a law firm or whatever to do the incorporation you know the incorporation what you do is and get your certificate of incorporation is like your birth certificate hmm. so the company's lifespan is between your like a human being's lifespan is between the birth certificate and the death certificate what happens the human the life cycle it is the same in companies your lifespan of a corporate entity is from the certificate of incorporation till your winding up takes place and the name is stuck off which is the death certificate at the at the register of companies that is absolutely uh, uh, doctor if you can um, uh, uh, listen into most of your lectures i've seen that you give a lot of reference to the case law that is uh, that has been preceded i think one uh, is pertaining to how the companies act as an individual after the incorporation happens now this is something that i think you'll have to you've had to repeatedly explain but if we can just visit that one more time i think uh, the the case comes from Sal- salomon with a salomon and uh, how the company is specifically a separate entity to the individuals that are involved in in beginning it how 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 are companies today when it comes to sri lanka because one key clarification because laymen tend to watch this program between sole traders partnerships and then the companies that exist are they the same thing do sole trader are we in under our topic are we talking about sole traders and partnerships yeah. now there are several ways where you can do business in sri lanka one is as a sole proprietorship say for example mr perera wants to run a business a small boutique he calls it borella stores yeah. now borella stores has no separate legal ent- uh, entitlement if you want to sue borella stores you've got to sue mr perera Uh, at such as such an address carrying on business under the name style and firm of Morales Stores yeah. now as long as sole proprietorship it's fine government is very happy as long as you pay your taxes anyway you will you will have your uh, accounts done then you pay your taxes so it's not a must to be under the company to become a company yeah. so that sole proprietorship won't come under the corporate regime the company law regime it won't come under 7 of 2007 
The second category is partnerships. The two or more people can form a partnership. They are again, uh, it's not a separate legal entity. But then government is happy if you pay your taxes. So two, three people. So if you want to sue, I'll take the example of a law firm. Say if it's Julius and Creasy. Well, Mr. Julius and Mr. Creasy died 150 years ago. But the partnership has gone, going on, carry on business. So there'll be one A, B, C, D partners. So if you want to sue that partnership, you've got to sue all the partners. Right. All right. So uh, there is no separate legal existence. And you know, uh, all uh, law firms, all audit firms, they are partnerships. partnerships yeah. And so those two won't come under the Companies Act. So the companies that come under the Companies Act, you have two different men, limited liability and unlimited liability. And then you have your, we have a new, in, new introduction called the single shareholder company, which is another new feature in the Companies Act, number, section four of the Companies Act, right. or subsection one, an individual human being, or a uh, corporate entity, or the secretary to the tre treasury, can form a single shareholder company. Right, that is separate to a sole trader, that is. Yeah, so it becomes a company. Right. You were talking about the Salomon versus Salomon principle, yeah. uh, where it was established that uh, once you inform, incorporate a company, it's a different individual. Like Mr. Harry Jayavadana can sue a, a dist uh, distillery's company. Right. Those are two different entities. Right. So that is Salomon's principle, Salomon versus okay. Salomon. And then that was followed by Lee versus Lee Zaya Farming. In Sri Lanka, we followed the famous Oberoi case, Trade Exchange Ceylon Limited versus Asian Hotels Corporation, right. where the separate legal entity principle was established. It is the same. All over the world, it is the same. Right. So once a company is incorporated, I told you, single shareholder company, it can be a private company, it can be a public company, it can be a public listed company, PLC, it can be a guarantee company, whatever the form you call it, those companies come under the purview of the Act Number 7 of 2007. And if it's a PLC, it has another regime, the securities regime. Right. And uh, all companies come under the purview of the Registrar General of Companies, where all the documents are maintained at the Registrar, uh, of, Company. Registrar of Company, the Samagam Madhura, yeah. TR Vijay Vardhana Mouth. Right. Uh, Dr. A lot more things to discuss with you. We'll take a very short break. We are in discussion with President's Council, Dr. Harsha Kabral. Uh, stay with us on uh, Law, Line and Liberty. We are going to break down even further the corporate law within Sri Lanka. and I'm a junior architect. My question is on Sri Lanka's corporate governance. Are internal and external stakeholders of a company governed by the corporate law of Sri Lanka? Welcome back to Law, Land and Liberty. We are in conversation with President's Council, Dr. Harsha Kabra. Um, doctor, the first segment, a very important part about the, the fundamentals that we are dealing with. Next on a bit about corporate governance now a wide area that uh, I want to cover with you on this, Doctor. Uh, firstly, about the, the salient aspects of what responsibilities lie with the different different individuals that are involved uh, within a company. You now there are the shareholders, there are the directors. Um, still, even to this day, we are, there are certain misconceptions, certain confusions. Uh, how do you, in fact, uh, approach this topic on yeah. corporate governance? That's a very important area because uh, I see the director's duties, responsibilities, and liabilities has become a key feature when it comes to litigation, when it comes to overall corporate governance. I mean, you know, you can see, well, corporate governance in companies and that's the private sector and the corporate governance uh, uh, in the public sector, which has failed, you see. So uh, the idea of the, the concept of corporate governance uh, originates from the Companies Act itself, the company law very specifically in our companies Act, for the first time in Sri Lanka, uh, we introduced the section 184, which specifically says uh, companies should be managed by a board of directors right. who are appointed by the shareholders. Right. So that's shareholder democracy to appoint. Shareholders don't run companies. If shareholders were to run companies, uh, John Keels, Haley's would have been managed by millions of shareholders. <laughs> so they appoint 
at uh, uh, competent people. So if you appoint the wrong people, you're in trouble. Yeah. So, right? So it's like politics. You know, you appoint your uh, MPs to parliament, and they they are after the cabinet and all that. They manage the show. So uh, one eighty four specifically says that we, we didn't have that earlier. Okay. So, but arising out of that, then there are certain things the board can delegate. The board cannot delegate because in the articles there are certain things like they, in the company act you would find only the word director and board of directors. Right. In 534 sections nowhere you will find the word managing director. Even uh, right? independent independent directors, directors non -independent. Non all that will come either in your articles. Articles will tell you okay you will have a chairman, you will have a managing director, you will have X amount of uh, executive directors, non-executive. Then independent directors, independent non-executive directors come from the corporate governance regime. Just to uh, interrupt you there, Doctor, then does, doesn't that create a confusion in the litigation aspect? When, when, no. you, when, when, you, 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 when you have been here to see who's held accountable if the, if the act speaks about the directors. Yeah, so directors all and sundry are responsible. That is what I want to come to. Yeah. Directors' responsibilities arise from the Companies Act, Articles of Association, and also the now in a listed company to the corporate governance mechanism, uh, the SEC regime, securities regime as well. Right. Now, as I told you, 184 speaks of that. Then there are a couple of important sections for all corporates, right? One section is 187, which specifically 186 says you know, there are certain things you can delegate, you can certain things you can't delegate. Yeah. So you can have sometimes uh, the American concept, the international concept where you the, the board, the points, uh, um, C, uh, uh, hired CEO, CFO, COO to yeah. manage the company. But uh, otherwise the board is responsible. There are certain things you can delegate, there are certain things you can't delegate. Right. Now, then there are a few section, three, four sections coming along with 187, 188, 189. Specifically says in black and white, you must, when you are a director, you must act in the best interest of the company. Uh, you must act bona fide, right? right? No mala fide action. So 187 says, act in the best interest on the company and act in good faith. Right. Then the next section says, you must follow when you're on the board as a director, you must follow the provisions of the articles of association and the provisions of the Companies Act. Then the next section says that the, 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 you can't act in a rash or negligent manner. Right. The, the standard of care that is expected from you. So those three sections are absolutely important. And then uh, 191 to 200 says conflict of interest in shares, conflict of interest in uh, contracts. Right. And those are very important. Yeah, and plus you, you yeah. have two other sections, uh, 219, 220, where serious loss of capital, how they should act. There is criminal liability, civil liability if you don't act properly. And then there is another important section, section 57, the solvency test. Right, how? Now these things are privy to the directors. Right. So if you go and appoint a director who can't read or write, Right. Just because he's over 18 or whatever, uh, then you are in trouble. You appoint the wrong people, then you got you need another Aragalia to take them off. <laughs> you see? Yeah, uh, doctor, if you can just give us a breakdown of I think there are multiple things that you brought out, but uh, something that I want to touch on is the the loss of capital and how a director or of that sort is held accountable in the event. I don't know if I'm phrasing this correctly, but if they make a wrong decision per se. Uh, how, what is the yeah? So the mechanism? sections I mentioned, yeah. right? With say 219, 220, that is serious loss of capital and situations where the company is in a um, insolvency situation. Now these things are known by the board first. <coughs> Shareholders won't know it. Now even the solvency level of a company, section 57 says solvency. That's a brand new section. Those are new sections we have brought in. Yeah. Brought in for a particular purpose yeah. because the company started crashing internationally, locally, whether it's Enron or Worldcom or Satyam or our own uh, Pramukha or say Golden Key. Yeah. What was the reason? Yeah. Either they were siphoning off, right? So the directors were responsible, ably assisted by crookish uh, auditors, company secretaries, lawyers, yeah. professional uh, involvement was also there in all these uh, examples I gave you. Yeah. So to avoid all that, now the solvency test is 57 is the solvency test to ensure that the company is solvent. That doesn't mean that you have to close shop and go. Yeah. If the company is not solvent, you can't do certain things. In my books I say it's a golden thread that runs across the entire fabric of corporate law. Yeah. Because you can't, 
buy back shares, you can't uh, declare dividends, you can't give bonus, you can't have tamashas. Yeah. That's basically to say, well, you have to <laughs> tighten your belt if yeah. the company is not. That doesn't mean that you are run away. Yeah. It's like, you know, if you have thousand rupees in your pocket and if you want to have a meal, you will not walk into spoons at Hilton. Yes. Right? You will end up washing dishes. Yes. So, but that doesn't mean that with thousand rupees you can't have a meal. Well, you go to Rhyme or someplace, have a good biryani for mm-hmm. 600 rupees or whatever. Yeah. So, but then you have to cut the coat according to the cloth. You see, you, have, you can't have, you know, if you can see you know, what the country is facing. Yeah. It's a, I mean, if I give a parallel, well, I think the Tamasha we had on the 4th of February, right? Planes going up there, you know, a whole lot of things for independence. And a month later, we go into a bankrupt situation. We don't have a drop of oil or a petrol for a three-wheeler. Now the things we wasted on all that. So that is basically solvency. You know, when you are not solvent, you must act within your means. So these are the things we have been brought. Now, without solvency, companies can't do this type of thing. Right? right? You can't have tamashas if you see the companies that have crashed. Right? I mean, if the company is not doing well, you can't get a uh, well, um, fleet of S-class Mercedes for all the directors. Yeah. Here, the company is not doing well, but you know, we are having a happy time, a party time. Yeah. So that is uh, the importance of the directors, because these things are known firstly by the directors. Shareholders know only at the, you know, if it's a listed company by the time the quarterly reports come or if otherwise at a AGM annual reports or whatever. So uh, you have to have some amount of responsibility or you know, in the driving seat. Yeah. So actually I always say that, you know, for the students I'd say the solvency test is like the, uh, the, the red light that comes on your dashboard in the petrol, you know, the petrol is low, that will come. So that is to the driver, not to the, not to the wife who is seated or the children seated behind, yeah. you see. So shareholders are the others, yeah. the, the directors are the basically the driver. So the board of directors should, see if they don't do it, that decision, it's a very crucial decision. Yeah. Company can crash land. Yeah. So because of that, there is civil liability, criminal liability, if they don't act properly. That the liability will be exercised by the shareholders, that is. No, the directors are first responsible. Yeah, they're held responsible. Held responsible. In, in that case, In that the case, the creditors yeah. can come up and say, ah, right, well, you have right, acted. Right. Uh, the other stake- stakeholders, including the shareholders. Right. Uh, Doctor, uh, if we can move from that point onwards to raising capital, and what exa- I've, I've heard a lot about how you have mentioned this, and uh, what we know generally staying outside, as in approaching the corporate field, is, is generally loans from a uh, bank, a developmental bank, if you uh, if the enterprise is just booming. Um, how 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 does the companies act really govern the aspect of raising capital? Yeah, you know, basically you need capital. Right, you need the you need capital to go on with the company. You yeah. see, you need that is that is basically the you know the oxygen Basics. for the company <laughs> yeah. business. Yeah. So how do you raise capital? Say so initially you have an initial share issue, right? That brings it there. You are, as a shareholder, you bring in people, and then there are various share issues. After that, you can have a rights issue. Every shareholder is given a right to buy at a, a discount. That's a rights issue. Then you can have a bonus issue, yeah. right? If you want to. Set, uh, give out something from your uh, what you have made profits. So you have the initial rights issue, initial issue, then the rights issue and the bonus issue. Yeah. In addition to that, you can also raise. I mean, you can go and get loans from banks. That is, uh, borrowing powers are there for any individual, like an indiv- human being. You can go and uh, give some collateral, corporate uh, security, uh, or even personal security, and get whatever current uh, finance for the company. But in addition, you can uh, go for uh, the, so instruments like the debentures, yeah. right, to collect money. Then you can have share warrants. Yeah. So there are a whole lot of mechanisms where you raise uh, funds for the company. But only thing is the ordinary shareholder is the risk-bearing shareholder. Right. Whereas uh, once the company makes profits and declare dividends, right, uh, they get a return on that. Yeah. Now that is not a fixed return. If you do very well, you might get a better return. If you don't do well, if you don't make profits, you don't get anything. Yeah. Whereas the debenture and the share warrants is basically like a contract. It's like a fixed deposit. Right. Yeah. Whether the company makes profits or not, they've got to pay it. Right. Uh, doctor, since our next segment is going to be on the SEC Act, I think it's important if we can uh, talk a bit about 
the stock market in this instance and uh, talk a bit about how the issuing of shares, how IPOs function and uh, primarily basically how, how uh, the public is involved and I think that discussion can start with uh, how we are registered now. Some would be unclear about what a limited companies or unlimited liability companies and how that is identified within within our within within the legislation in our country and doctor if you could give us a bit of a breakdown of what a guarantee company is yeah. and uh, what those the yeah, basic start identifications with the bottom very the guarantee company first now it's one category of companies where you need objects right there is a mandatory obligation to have objects in a guarantee company now say if you want to Say if you come to me and say, well, I'm, I'm getting a grant from, um, uh, say, United States uh, to help the ch children who lost their parents uh, during tsunami. Yeah. What sort of company you recommend? Yeah. That's a guarantee company. Guarantee company's purpose is that they are they have created that particular company for a particular purpose. There are objectives. That is, you plow back whatever you make into the company. So the there are only members of guarantee companies. Right. So the members don't benefit, okay. right? It's like the trustee concept. They are only like like a trustee. Yeah. So all that you make goes back, plowed back into the business. So there are no dividends declared or whatever. So that is the purpose of the guarantee company. You have a purpose. Just to clarify, doctor, it's primarily a non-profit or not-for-profit yes. kind of uh, entity. Yes. When it comes to guarantee companies. Okay. So I was, uh, if you may go back before getting on to the SCC. Yeah. I must say, you, the first uh, question you asked was the director's liability, and then came the corporate governance mechanism. Yeah. All right. Now, uh, out of the, all the concepts uh, in the corporate law, well, the director's duties, responsibilities, liabilities I referred to are fairly. I mean, when you introduce, they said that these are draconian laws. Are even, it'll be difficult for company to find directors. Well, you have independent, you have direct, working directors, uh, so on, so on, and so forth. But the question is, there are a couple of defenses also. Yeah. 190 is one of the defenses we brought in where you can rely on third party expertise, right? Then you can uh, have, to, there's another concept we have brought in, indemnity and insurance for directors. Right. I would never go on a board if there is no indemnity and insurance covered. Well, the company must look after our interest because we have acted in good faith and something has gone wrong. Yeah. So you can have expertise from elsewhere, you can have internal expertise and you can rely on that. So you always cover yourself and uh, it's safer to have that type of thing. And then came corporate governance. It is a late development and though it's a American uh, concept corporate governance, but it was in introduced to the, uh, the, the English law only in 1992. Right. So Adrian Cadbury in England uh, brought this uh, Cadbury code. It was called the best practice, right. code of best practice which uh, was brought in for the listed companies in the London Stock Exchange. They had to comply. And if you're not, why? It was voluntary code of best practice. I mean, basically, corporate governance is to say that, you know, your company is a good company. Long years ago, if the company made profits, uh, it was considered a good company, but not anymore. So because you can't, you know, upset the environment and then uh, make profits. True. So you, a corporate governance is basically you have transparency the in management, uh, uh, all the stakeholders are happy, the, the shareholders, majority, minority, both. Then the employees, then your creditors, then your uh, the, the, the people who trade with you, right? Your customers. customers. And then the world at large. Right. Is, that is where you do CSR, corporate social responsibility. Right. right, I mean, so something you do, something more than now, for example, uh, the Manusad Dharana program, that's a corporate uh, social responsibility phenomenon. You, that you don't have, uh, that you, your business is something else. Yeah. Like, let's say, um, uh, Otara's uh, Embark project, you know, yeah. washing those, uh, cleaning those dogs on a, a nothing to do with a business. Yeah. So these are CSR projects. Yeah. To ultimately, to the world at large, you're a good corporate citizen. Right. So we followed, though it started in 92, in 97, Sri Lanka started our own mechanism of corporate uh, practice, best practices. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, we have a corporate governance committee between the Institute of Chartered Accountants and the uh, Securities Exchange Commission. We keep on improving that every year. And uh, we have our own code, code of best practice. We have the mandatory code and the voluntary code. Voluntary code can be, I mean, these are only for listed companies, but anyone is free to follow it. Right. Whether it's your, your listed or not, these are good things. Yeah. 
Um, doctor, I, uh, we, since we are going running out of time, I want to go to our last segment and we'll continue our discussion there. Uh, we are in conversation with President's Council, Dr. Harsha Kabral. You're watching Law, Line and Liberty. Stay with us. and I'm an economics graduate. So my question is on Sri Lanka's new SEC Act. How has the new SEC Act in Sri Lanka affected the company law in the country? Welcome back to Law, Land and Liberty. We are in conversation with President's Council, Dr. Harsha Kabral. This will be our last segment and we will talk a bit about the Securities and Exchange Commission Act. Uh, doctor, uh, before we just proceeding to it, if we can talk about this act in particular will be in reference to the listed companies. Uh, how do we get there? What, what sort of companies really fall under the purview? And then what are the salient features of the new act? Yeah, initially I mentioned about the different types of companies we have. Now all those companies come under the purview of the Registrar General of Companies and that's a repository for all the documents. Yeah. We keep, you know, 46 forms I refer to. The company secretaries know very well what has to be kept there, everything. So it's in the public domain. Anyone can go and check all those and things like that. But if your company is a public listed company, you come under the purview of the registrar of companies. In addition to that, you come under the purview of the securities regime, right? And uh, when you say securities regime, it is the SEC Act, the SEC on top, it's an umbrella. Yeah. Below that, you have the CSC, Colombo Stock Exchange, Security Exchange Commission. Security Exchange Commission has uh, 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 statute, uh, the law, SEC Act, and then the rules. Under that, you find the CSC, Colombo Stock Exchange. They have their own rules. Yeah. Below that, you find the CDS, Central Depository System. Right? So as CSC and CDS you take together, that's the playing field for the people who buy and sell shares. That's a trading flow. right? So this is the securities regime we talk about. Now, that is mainly for the listed companies. Why that regulatory element is important? Because public come and invest in shares. Uh, the average public. Yeah. So the state has a responsibility to ensure that there is a level playing field, everything is uh, tickety boo, and you know, um, no one, in your private company, it's your own money as long as you don't cheat your creditors. Yeah. You have a lot of lineage, leverage, and that type of thing. But when it's a listed company, like the banks, yeah. now the banks, it's not only the shareholders' money, it is the depositors' money. So there is a responsibility. So in addition to that, there are a couple of other regulators as well. Yeah. The, if, if it's a bank or a lending, other lending institution, the central bank, the monetary board, is another regulator. Yeah. They have bank supervision, yeah. they have non-bank supervision. Right? That's fairly stringent. Yeah. Right? The people who have been on bank boards would know. In a finance company, they know. That's a fairly stringent area, regulation. And then you have insurance regulator, if it's a business, it's insurance. So the regulatory element is there, but when it comes to the securities regime, the SCC Act is right on top. We got a brand new act the other day, I mean in 2019, uh, 2021, uh, uh, yeah. right? Uh, 19 of 2021, 2019 right? 2021. That's the, the latest. That was also, that also had a fairly long gestation period and a couple of changes were brought in. Yeah. Now, I must say, it's always, I mean, we, we in the, I mean, this, we, we do this in the corporate governance mechanism also, see what are the gray areas. What are the improvements? Because there are so many other areas in uh, other parts of the world. You know, we look at the London Stock Exchange, New York Stock Exchange, uh, uh, Japanese sensing, a lot of things, right? Uh, Hong Kong, all these places to see whether we are behind or what, what we are missing. Then we keep on improving. So this was long overdue. And the new act gives more power to the SEC. Okay. Additional teeth given right and bringing in new concepts for me i feel that it's a good thing right right, right. A, for a long time well the regulatory mechanism needed change and we have brought in it's up to the regulators to see whether it works well or not right. so the idea is proper regulation right. um doctor if i can i think when we spoke to president's council viraj on this also he brought this up the new sec act now most people would see the sec as a 
policemen in most regards and that that is the regulatory aspect but in this specific act we see more of a, of a prominence given to the market and the market expansion aspect how the market can advance also how we can bring in more individuals involved in this and at the end of the day that's a really good thing uh, how how do you approach that aspect dr what is what is the core uh, what, let's say objective of the sac act in this now, the idea is to bring confidence right. investors local or foreign enlisted entities you need a lot of confidence so unless your laws are in place and if the if they, if they are practical if they are been used properly right i as a practitioner i can tell you well we try and use all these new mechanisms to see so uh, civil remedies criminal remedies whistleblower mechanisms there are quite a lot of new features you see in this new act yes. so it's up to the i mean you know we unfortunately from 2019 onwards to 2020 2021 we had the covid and 2022 we are having yeah. this economic crisis yeah. so uh, it's difficult for you to see the results of these uh, new statutes yeah. but the i must say well the laws are very clear whether it's companies act number 7 of 2007 or the scc act number 19 of 2021 the provisions are available it is up to the players to see whether they in the actual practice whether it will work or not i mean even there are so many novel features in the companies act which uh, were to be tested most of these sections are because uh, when i wrote that red book i realized that there are 133 sections for criminal liability right, right? against directors and officers then 31 sections on civil liability now we always go on oppression mismanagement and you know derivative action those are the very common i mean that's bread and butter for us uh, but other than that there are several provisions which can be tested actually there have a couple of uh, actions we filed in this uh, uh, golden key scenario but unfortunately the there was a fundamental rights application and uh, i personally feel that there was no fundamental right because you go voluntary and deposit money in a, a private uh, organization just because you are getting a, a higher premium right artificial premium uh, return on that and then i don't see any fundamental right but unfortunately uh, and fundamental rights and they this purpose was lost and there are a couple of cases we t- tried to test on the new provisions but unfortunately all those cases were stayed uh, uh, frozen because of the fundamental rights application in the supreme court so there are enough and more provisions which can be tested whether it's uh, companies act number 7 of 2007 or uh, the, the scc act number 19 or 2021 uh, for the young lawyers there's a lot of room for them to play around you know so to it's important that uh, these provisions are used in a proper manner and uh, then the so that the investor public will be confident there are risk protection judiciary has to look at the bench and the bar both will have to act in a more responsible manner and uh, so then we can you know there a lot of confidence in the investment right uh, doctor as a uh, moving towards the conclusion of the program that we have today i'm sure there's a lot more that we can talk about but if you were to point out within the scc act and in 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 comparison to the uh, the the companies act as well what are the next steps that we need to take or are we in a pretty much evolved state because the general consensus is okay the law in sri lanka needs to improve we need to evolve we are a bit behind is that the a similar thought process to what you no want? i i always say we have to act within the parameters of the law we have we can't complain that the laws are are kind of especially these two laws there are a couple of other laws which are okay but i must say companies act number 7 of 2007 and also uh, the scc act the new scc act 19 of 2021 there is quite a lot of pluses right it's up to the players to make it work and also use the provisions of the law to their advantage and these organizations also must make use of them registrar general of company has a lot of powers under the companies act i hardly see any inquiries taking place we have trying to introduce new provisions if you go through the provisions at the 534 sections you see what a lot of powers are given right and then we i told you the example we always go for the uh oppression mismanagement yeah. derivative action type of remedy and but there are so many others especially for the younger generation lawyers they, they must study this you must you know study this make use of these provisions whether it's in the companies act or in the uh, scc act both can be tested and if the 
regulators are strong and they take bold decisions and they show that there will be a lot of confidence by the shareholder public, local and uh, the investors, local and foreign both. So it is up to the, so to see that uh, these provisions are made use of. Yeah. That is, uh, I mean, even um, the other, other important thing is case law. Yeah. All right. And uh, we have very few reported cases, right? Uh, I have uh, put out some books on uh, during COVID period, I had the time. Uh, all reported cases from 1886 to 2021, companies, all company law cases in Sri Lanka, I have in four volumes. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and then you see, uh, very rarely do we get good reported judgments. Right, so that is, I mean, majority of the cases that are reported, I we say, are on fundamental rights, right? And uh, for the students, for the law to grow, for the academia to grow, for the corporate sector to grow, we must have very good judgments. So I hope and pray that you know the younger generation lawyers will take them up to the Supreme Court and get good decisions. And like in India, now say India, you get a whole lot of case law. Yeah. Ours is our, our case law that way. Judge-made law is minimal whether it's corporate law, any other area, intellectual property or whatever. We have loads of uh, fundamental rights cases, but very rarely you get, uh, I mean, good reported cases would be for a year, maybe 10 maximum, you see. So it should be in hundreds. Right. So then the law will develop, True. even to you make use of the new provisions of where the laws be introduced. True. Um, Doctor, again, a lot of things to speak with you, but I think the wealth of experience you have, you have shared quite a lot within this very short time period, and I'm very much grateful for that. President's Counsel, Dr. Harsha Cabral, who has been joining us on corporate law. Doctor, I hope you'll join us again on another topic and we can really continue this discussion. Uh, you being uh, one of the main architects of the Companies Act uh, number 7 of 2007 and being within the field for a very long time, I once again thank you for joining us uh, and thank you for sharing uh, so much of important information on this subject matter. Thank you, Doctor. Pleasure. All right. As we speak about the importance of business venture and the frameworks that govern it, it is very important to bear in mind the commitment to fairness and integrity that should be undertaken in the pursuit of profit. Former United States Attorney General Eric Holder put these very thoughts in a very concise manner. No individual or company, no matter how large or how profitable, is about the law. That is all from us here at Law, Land and Liberty. If you had missed today's program, you can watch the entire episode on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. Join us again next week as we break down a contemporary legal topic. I'm Danidhita Anamasa. Have a great night.